to God. Thank you. You may be seated if you if you can sit down and do that. Yeah, glory to God. Oh, isn't the Lord special? I'm telling you, Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. I I know the Lord has touched our hearts and touched our lives today, and Jesus really does deserve all of this praise and pageantry that we've presented before and more than we could ever present would Jesus deserve because he is everything that we've that we've sung about everything that we've exalted today Jesus deserves that and he's he's the he's the fulfillment of every, every bit of that and the epitome of all and and even more and my prayer is now in this brief little moment that we have together uh in, in a word from him today. And I believe the Lord has given me a word for today for us. And, um, and it really, you know, when I was uh, being challenged with it by the, by the Lord, and you say, what, God, how? I mean, you, you always talk about these things like God spoke to you or you felt like this is a word from the Lord. What does that mean? Well, I know people think that somehow the Lord opens the window and, you know, says, Pastor, you know, here's what I want. You know. But let me assure you that it, it, it's not like that, or it hasn't been for me like that in my 45 years. It's much louder than, it's much louder than that. It's, it's, it's like on the inside. It, it's, like, it's like it just kind of comes and, and the Holy Spirit just, just rushes it and, and, and I become excited in my, in, my, in my spirit and in my brain that is filled with study and preparation and, 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 and lots of uh, information and, and, and stuff through, that through the years the, the Holy Spirit has deposited in there and caused you to be able to remember. And then he just kind of begins to draw out of you lots of things that have been placed inside of you. And let me just say this uh, as a word, and, and this, is, this is not to try to be uh, uh, theatrical in any way about this, but uh, what I have found from the Lord is that very seldom does he draw out of you something that's not been placed into you. Uh, I know a lot of people would give the illusion that these things that I might say to you or that other ministers might say to you and messages and so forth are just things that just pop out of thin air as if somehow God just speaks to you about these majestic and miraculous and heavy things with no background and no basis for you having any understanding about it at all. No, most of the time what God does is what what you put in through discipline and study and preparation and, and all of that, uh, the Holy Spirit draws it out of you. In other words, God doesn't bless laziness and lack of preparation and so forth. God takes all of those things and he just pulls out of you what he wants to say to us. And I believe that that's, God has a word today about this and it's really the overall context of what I might say to you today. And I, you noticed I didn't give you an outline because I didn't really want to put it at the top of the outline. Let me tell you the difference between Santa Claus and the Savior. You know, I mean, it kind of seemed, kind of seemed like a little silly kind of thought there. But what I want to do and what I believe the Lord would have us to do today is basically look at uh, the difference between what this world says Christmas is all about and what it means and, and, and all of the things that it reflects the, the traditions of everything that we've looked at and we go through every year and we perpetrate every year and the truth of God, what God actually did and does at Christmas. And, and so let's look at uh, so, and, and contrast some difference between what tradition says Christmas is all about and the truth of what God says that we should notice in what Christmas should be about each year. I uh, have me a little bottle. Of, I don't know, you guys can't see this, but this is like a little uh, small bottle of something that has really taken hold in the last 10 or 15 years. I, I can't, I, I don't know, maybe a little longer, but I've begun to notice. This is a little bottle of hand, san, hand sanitizer. You guys oh, yeah. use, are aware of this? And we use this kind of stuff all the time nowadays because uh, we have all kinds of germs and bacteria and all that kind of stuff floating around. And you 
see these kind of this kind of little thing everywhere: department stores, uh, um, you know, restroom facilities, uh, restaurants, uh, hospitals, uh, and, and it's really good. You know, you go into the uh, Going, going through the information area of a hospital, and I got a little, little thing hanging up, and you can squirt it, and, and, and what this does. By the way, just for interest's sake, uh, uh, how many of you here this morning have, have a bottle, maybe something like this, a little bottle on you right here? Hey, and remember, this is God's house, so don't be lying. All right, yeah, yeah, okay, wonderful. See, there's a lot of people with it, you know, just carried around with you, and, then, and when you get in crowds, you know, and you shake hands, and you tell, you know, you just put a little bit of that on, and uh, what this does is it kills germs and bacteria and so forth so that you don't catch diseases and sicknesses and that kind of stuff. And, and, and I know this may sound, you know, like a little stretch, uh, and maybe it's just my crazy kind of mind, the way my mind works, but when I was looking at this and, and I just happened to have a little bottle of it, I thought to myself, I said, you know, I wonder, um, I wonder if, if, if somehow... Uh, We've not sanitized Christmas, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, have we killed? Have we killed the Jesus germ? Uh, and nobody now really catches the real thing, which is the the real uh, spirit of Christmas. And I know that those of us with children and those of us with, with grandchildren um, are all excited about Christmas through the eyes of our children and our grandchildren. And in a couple of days now, we're just a few days away, and we're all excited about, you know, about Santa and the Christmas tree and the lights and the gifts and, and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm not going to stand up here and try to preach today about how we should be ashamed of the fact that we celebrate Christmas and we have all these different things that we do, uh, like somehow I'm the ghost of Christmas grunch up here trying to make everybody feel guilty about trying to do all that. Uh, I love all the pageantry and I love all the tradition and all the, all the celebration, but we don't need to kill the Jesus germ and forget what Christmas is really all about because the ultimate present from God is the presence of Jesus Christ. God's ultimate gift to us at Christmas is the presence of, of his son, the savior of this world, Jesus Christ. And so I wanna contrast with you very quickly today and simply now, it's not gonna be some theological giant of a word, but I wanna just contrast with you today uh, five differences between what traditional Christmas says that it is, what we've celebrated and all of our pageantry through the years, and the truth about what God uh, gave us and still gives us at Christmas. Number one contrast, Christmas presents are based on behavior, but God's presence is based on grace. Let me say that again. Christmas, traditionally speaking, Christmas presents let me see if I've got a, yeah, we got one, there it is. Christmas presents are based on behavior, but God's presence is based on grace. Tradition, traditional Christmas says that if you are good, then you're going to get presents, right? right, right. Now, if you're bad, and I'm not sure if this is uh, if this is sectional for every section of the country, but we do have people in here from every section, so just let me know if I'm wrong about this. If you're good, tradition says you're going to get presents if you're good. But if you're bad, what are you going to get? A uh, lump of coal. Uh, in our little neighborhood, you got switches and ashes. Don't ask me where that came from. Or in some neighborhoods, you get a bag of switches. But, but what is that saying? If I'm good, I get presents. If I'm bad, I get switches and ashes. I get a lump of coal. Blah, blah. What, what, what is that really saying to us? What that's really saying to us is... According to tradition, in other words, you get what you earn. Tr Christmas tradition says that you get what you deserve. Now, I'm just saying to you that what God does at Christmas is God says that Jesus doesn't give his presence based on your behavior. Jesus doesn't give his presence based on the fact if you are good or bad, so be good for goodness sake. Jesus gives his presence based on his grace to us. 
And you may say, you may say but pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. And, and may I say to you that uh, what I've been preaching over the last several weeks, and I don't mean to insult you and I'm not trying to put down on you, it's the same things about me as about you is, uh, I'm good. Uh, the only thing that we need to recognize is that our good is not good enough. If we could be as good as we possibly could be, it would not be good enough. Let me just give you two or three little passages quickly. Uh, Romans 3.10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. <laughs> yeah, there's no one that is righteous. Righteous just means I try to live right. It means I try to be right. I, I'm pursuing uh, living the right kind of life with the right kind of attitude and the right kind of spirit. And I mean, that's really all that means. And the Bible says that none of us, not a single one of us are righteous. No, not one. And then a few verses later in 323, it tells us why. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So no matter how Good we are, no matter how much we try, no matter how much our struggle, we are not good enough because we have fallen short of the glory of God. And Isaiah, in Isaiah 64, Isaiah, the great prophet of God, says, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness is as filthy rags in the presence of God. Now, I could translate for you directly what filthy rags is in Hebrew, and I, but I don't, wanna, <laughs> I don't think I want to do that. But let me just tell you, it, 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 that's, that's not a compliment. It's, it's, a, it's a very unclean thing is what Isaiah says, that if I was as good as I possibly could be, that when God looked at all of my goodness, it would be... Whew, it would be insulting. It would be an unclean thing before God. As good as I could do, my offering would still be unclean. The Apostle Paul said in the book of Philippians, uh, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as dung. Everybody say manure. Now, uh, poop uh, might, might be a, a good word to use. In other words, the Apostle Paul says, I look at my life. Now, we're remember, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. We're not talking about... Uh, somebody that just drug up off the street. We're talking about the greatest apostle of all time. We're talking about probably the most brilliant spiritual person this side of Jesus Christ that has ever lived on this earth. And that wonderful, marvelous, spirit-filled person said, if I did, if you took everything I did in life, all of my goodness, all of my knowledge, all of the great works, all of the establishment of the spirit, everything that God has ever done through me, I look at everything that was good in my life and I just look at it and say, it is, that, that, that's, just, that's just manure before God. So if I was as good as I could possibly be, I still wouldn't deserve the grace of God. Now, I'm not going to embarrass my children, which Justin's the only one I have here today that's directly my child, uh, with some potty training story. Uh, <laughs> But I will embarrass my grandchildren. Uh, Gavin's sitting here on the front row with him, so no. <laughs> I'm relaxed, bro. I'm not going to embarrass you either. <laughs> no, we all have common experiences, though. I mean, every parent and grandparent in here has common potty training experiences, right? I mean, we all experience the same thing. And what it usually is, is, you know, it comes time to teach the little fella how to go to the potty on their own. And so we either do one of two things. We either put the little potty in the... In the, in the bathroom in our home, and it becomes like the little potty throne. You know, it's like the, you know, the celebrated place. Or we drag it out and put it in a little family room so we can hopefully get our child on it and then teach them how to potty on the potty. And blah. Well, anyway, as, as that happens, then, you know, we, we take them occasionally over and say, okay, now you potty. We need for you to potty, baby. And then all the adults in the room... Uh, grandparent, parent, and we all hover around, and we look, and we say, okay, baby, you, you potty on the potty, and then everybody's anticipating and going, is it going to happen? And then all of a sudden, it, 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 you know, they begin to use the potty, and, we, and then what are all the adults doing? They're looking down, and they're going, yay, yay, you did it, yay, we're so proud of you, oh my goodness, and then 
And then hopefully, yeah, he's a hero. And then all of a sudden, you know, we take the little potty and we put it in the little room. And then, and then occasionally our child will begin to learn by themselves to go back there and, and, and take care of business. And, and then they'll come out and they'll say, they'll come out and they say, Daddy, 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 look, I, look what I did, Daddy, Daddy. And we walk over and look at the potty and go, yeah, yeah you did it. It's wonderful. Yeah. Now, put this in, 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 in reference to what God says about our goodness and, and, and recognize that, that, that when it comes to, to goodness, we look at God and we say, we say Daddy, 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 uh, look, look how good I've been, God. Uh, Daddy, 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 look how nice I've been, God. Daddy, Daddy, look, 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 look how spiritual I am. Oh, God. And God is looking down at our little potty of goodness and potty of spiritualness and potty. And God looking down and God's going, yeah. Yay, you did it. Well, listen, what I'm saying is our best, our best is as filthy rags before God. Our best is unclean before God. So aren't you glad that the presence of God is not based on your behavior, but is based on God's grace? And Christmas says, you get what you deserve. If you're naughty, you get switches and ashes. If you're nice, you get presents. But God says it's not based on what you do. It's based on his grace that he gives us his presence because we don't deserve it at all. Second contrast. Christmas presents are limited, but God's presence is unlimited. Christmas comes one time a year, right? Santa lives up at the North Pole with Mrs. Santa and the reindeer and some elves and some uh, assorted seasonal workers uh, <laughs> that help him out. We stood in line a couple of nights ago down at the Harbor Lights Festival and waited to speak to Santa. By the way, they have a wonderful one down there. It looks just like what I think Santa would look like. I, I went and I, when we finally made it to Santa. I, you know, I watched, uh, I watched our, our grandson, you know, tell Santa and all that. And this guy looked, boy, he was just like Santa. I looked at him. I said, uh, shook his hand as we all walked out of the room. I said, man, you look just like, you look just like what I think Santa would look like. I said, I bet you get told that a lot in life, you know. In real life, you probably have people come up to you and say, man, you look... He said, this is real life. I said, great, you smell good too. Uh, I started asking, what kind of cologne is that you have? I, I'm, always look, I'm always looking for something great. <laughs> but but, but uh, Christmas says, tradition says, okay, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're good enough to deserve his presence, that he's going to come one night in the year and, and, and you better make sure that you're asleep because if you come, if he comes and you're not asleep, then he's going to pass you by, right? And as he comes, he's going to come this one night a, a year. And why does he only come one night a year? Because his presents are limited. He has a limited supply of presents. So he can only come one night in the year if you have done enough to deserve it and if you've been good enough. But the Bible tells us, like in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, that Jesus is the Word of God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and everything was made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, that he made everything, that he has all power, that he created everything around us, that he has no limits on his ability to supply and provide for us. And then it tells us that the word that did all of this wonderful stuff was made flesh. And everybody say, he put some skin on and he came to this world in order to, in order to fellowship with us. And in the Gospel of Matthew, this might be surprising that when the angel in the Gospel of Luke told Mary she was highly favored with God and that what was inside of her 
was conceived by the Holy Spirit, that she had not had any relations with a man that would create a pregnancy, but that she was indeed pregnant and that what she was pregnant with, the Holy Spirit had placed inside of her. Uh, she didn't talk to Joseph about it. This has always been amazing to me because I'm thinking the first thing uh, I would do is if an angel visited me, I would tell Tanya, hey, Tanya, I don't know, this sounds a little strange, but I had a visitor last night, an angel, and this is what the angel said to me, and I, you need to know that, but no, 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 no. No, uh, months went by, month, month, months went by, and Mary began to show, and when she began to show, the Bible says that Mary being found with child, as if she was trying to hide it, you know, I said, you know she was found. In other words, somebody looked down and said, I believe something going on with you, baby. You got a big tumor growing inside of you or something. And then, and then all of a sudden, Joseph looks at her and says, what's, what's going on with you, you know? Uh, and she said, God got me pregnant. And, and Joseph said, what? What kind of story is that? And then an angel came to see Joseph. And the angel says, don't be afraid to take Mary because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So Joseph, what she's saying is true, and, and, and she's going to birth a son, and then this, this is what he said, and you shall call his name Jesus, because he's going to save his people from their sins. And then the scripture says, and all of this was done so that that which was spoken by the prophet could be fulfilled, that his name would be Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus was never called Emmanuel by the people. He was always called Jesus. You know why? Because Emmanuel is not a title. Emmanuel is a character. And, and Isaiah says uh, his name's going to be Jesus, but his character is going to be God with us. In other words, he's not going to come and stay there and then leave. He's going he's to be there. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And so he doesn't come and then go away, that he comes and he stays. And so the presence of this world are limited, but God's presence in our life is unlimited. These, you know, we used to have political seasons in the country. I, I know some of you that have been, hadn't been around for very long don't recognize this. Now, I mean, because we live in, in politics now all the time. I mean, we, we don't have any off seasons. You know, there used to be times where people ran for an office, and then we got two or three years, and we didn't have to listen to all that junk, and, and then they'd run again, and we, you know, well, now it's, it's 24-7, uh, 365 for the whole life, but... But have you ever noticed how funny politicians are? They, uh, they have a strategy, and, and I'm, I hope I'm not breaking anybody's bubble, but it's called uh, the identification strategy. And the identification strategy just says, um, I'm going to have to do something to hopefully in, encourage these people to believe that I am like them. And therefore, they can identify with who I am because they can be convinced that I am like them. And so how is this uh, identification strategy employed? Well, you generally know this. I don't know if you've ever been in a, usually it's a factory or an industry, but it could be almost anything. And what happens is a motorcade pulls up outside filled with limousines and, and, and armored vehicles and, and a, some entourage or a giant bus and blah, blah. Anyway, and then very stealthily, the politician gets out, uh, takes off the pinstripe jacket, uh, rolls up uh, white sleeves, uh, puts on maybe some OSHA-approved gloves, uh, OSHA-approved uh, uh, safety glasses, a hard hat, um, walks in, carried in to a, 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 through a, a strategized location with cameras following them through. And when they come to some spot where they can get a good photo op of the people and the, what all, and then they stop and they smile. And, and, and it's funny how the people are acting. The people in there are going, yay! They're one of us. Hey, they identify with us. They, hey, look at them. They're just like us. They're just regular people just like us. And they're in here to show us how whoo, how they identify and how they want to. And, and, and may I say to you, these people are anything but somebody like you. 
Because as soon as that photo op is over, you know what happens? They slip out the side. They slip back out to that air-conditioned limousine that they just arrove, uh, arrived in. And then they, they put that uh, a row in. They put that, they put that pinstripe jacket back on, flip up that tie real nice, um, sit in that climate-controlled environment, and march on to the next site. They haven't lost anything. They haven't given anything. They, they still have their law degree. They still have their money. They still have their title. They still have their prestige. They still have all of that stuff that, that they arrived with. And what you have just experienced is an illusion, an illusion of identity. Because though it would be designed to look like it identified with you, it was just an illusion that you watched. It, they are not like you at all. What, 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 what am I getting to? Here's what I'm saying to you. Remember, we're talking about the presence of this world being limited, but the presence of God being unlimited. Jesus Christ left heaven and came down to earth. He was born in a manger with a, with, with a bunch of animals for nursemaids. He lived for 30 years on this earth without one single accolade or one single acknowledgement except to be told be sure to do what your parents tell you to do and go home and live a normal life and obey your parents, which he did. And at 30 years old, he performed his first miracle at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And then he went around the countryside doing nothing but good and loving people and performing miracles and giving greatness and being compassionate. And for all of his trouble, he was arrested he was lied about. He was rejected. They spit on him. They assaulted him. They nailed him to a cross, and then they washed their hands of it all. And what I'm saying to you is that this was not an illusion. This was the real thing, that Jesus Christ did not seek to give us some false impression that he is with us, that he actually is with us and sacrificed everything in his life in order to be with us. And so Jesus absolutely understands where we are in life. And the presence of Jesus is absolutely unlimited. The Bible says that he was, in tempt he was tempted in all forms like we are, yet without sin. But he looked at us and he said, I'm never going to leave you and I'm never going to forsake you. He said, I'm not a high priest that can't be touched with the feelings of your infirmities, but was in all forms tempted like you are without sin. And I'm just saying that that's what Christmas is all about, that Jesus is not an illusion of identification with us, that Jesus is the real thing. Pastor Tanya kind of alluded to this a moment ago. There are people who might be saying today, you know, Pastor... Nobody understands where I am. Nobody can, nobody can identify with me. My relationships are falling apart, Pastor. I mean, nobody understands. No, no, nobody, nobody can feel what I feel. My spouse left me, and my spouse took all the children, and I'm all alone, and no one understands me, and no one can help me. And to that, let me just add two words to that sentence. Except Jesus. Well, Pastor, you know, uh, 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 my children are on drugs, or uh, I'm, living with, I, I'm, I'm living with an abusive situation. I'm struggling with an addiction. Uh, Christmas is not a happy time for me. Christmas is hell on earth, and <laughs> nobody understands me except Jesus. My finances are falling apart. I just lost my job. My family's on the streets. No one understands me except Jesus. I'm struggling with depression. I have so much anger. My family doesn't want me anymore. I'm, I'm living a lie. No one understands me except Jesus. You see, the, the message of Christmas is that Jesus is touched with my infirmities. That Jesus identifies completely with me and has felt everything I felt has lived everything I live, and that his presence is here 
with me and he offers his presence as my present for Christmas, Jesus said, I am Emmanuel, I am God with you, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Forsake you. And that means when others have thrown you away and cast you out, Jesus is still going to hold you and love you and draw you close and say, no one can understand, but I understand and I still want you. And so come and let me, let me embrace you. Let me hold you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to withdraw my heart from you. I love you and I came for you and my presence is guaranteed not because of the fact that you're a good person or you behave well or you've done the right thing or you've been been nice and not naughty, but because my grace has come to surround you and be everything to you. Number three, Christmas presents are initiated by us, but God's presence is initiated by him. We can get this backwards if we're not careful. A lot of times we can begin to believe that if we're going to be close to God, then we're going to have to initiate that closeness. So so our job is to try to convince God to love us. That's how backwards we can get this thing. You know what Christmas says? You know what the, the truth says about that it was Jesus, it was God who initiated the search for us, not us for him. Now, let me just say what I'm about to say is probably might be offensive to somebody because, because I'm old school. Uh, I, and I am old school, and you know why I'm old school? Because I'm old. <laughs> and I was brought up in a generation who taught us how to be men. And we were taught in our generation that to be a man means that I am going to be an initiator. That if there is a relationship on this earth that is a natural relationship, like, like between me and some uh, and a woman that I love or that I, I think might like me, and I don't know, but she might like me, and I might like her. And in other words, uh, the, the relationship we were taught in my generation is if you sense this and this is something that you desire, that you as a man ought to initiate the relationship and it is your job to initiate that relationship. It is not her job to initiate the relationship. It's your job to initiate it. And so I've tried to convince my daughter, I don't really know if I've been successful or not, uh, try, I tried to uh, initiate with, with, with my daughter and with my granddaughters and with every girl that I've ever uh, pastored through the years to, that, that, that your job as, as a woman is to just sit there and look pretty. You know, you, 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 let, you, you let them pursue you. Make them sweat, you know. And, and, and you, just look, you, just, you just sit there and look pretty. And if he feels like uh, I, I like her and I, I think she kind of likes me and I, I don't know, but I would like to kind of establish a relationship with her, it's not your job. I, I've kind of heard, you know, conversations where you say, well, you know, should I, should I, should I call them? Should I text them? Should I uh, tweet her or whatever all that mess is? Um, uh, should I Facebook them? Uh, you know, I mean, what, 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 and let them know that I like, no, 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 no. I mean, my answer to that is no. You just sit there and look pretty. And you let them pursue you. I mean, when I pursued Pastor Tanya, which was ooh, 45 years ago, <laughs> you think, <coughs> do you think she pursued me? Mm-mm. No, she just sat there and looked pretty. You know what I did? I thought to myself, I said, man, that's, that's who I want right there. And you know what I did? I just kind of basically said, I want you. <laughs> And, and of course, she was starstruck. Uh, <laughs> couldn't believe that I wanted her, but, but, but now I'm just saying, I'm just saying, come on, men. I'm so good. I'm, I'm talking to you, Gavin. I, I mean, come on. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, man, if you like somebody, go for it. You need to, you need to take a shot at it, man. Don't, don't wait for them to come. I'm, and, and what I'm saying about this is that the scripture teaches us. And remember what we're talking about. I'm talking about that God came to initiate the love relationship with us. It's not the other way around. 
It's not our responsibility to, to pursue God. It's his responsibility to pursue us. He's the man and we're the woman. And he's the one that initiates the relationship. And it's not us that initiates the relationship. And this is what Christmas says to us because Jesus came to this earth in order to initiate a love relationship between us and God. In the Bible, the Bible teaches that Jesus is the heavenly what? Bridegroom. Everybody say the man. And the church, which is, look at your name and say, all of us. We are the bride, right? So in the, in the, in the initiation, it's the groom that pursues the bride, not vice versa. And if we get this backward, what, what begins to hap happen is we become like this, this, this needy little dysfunctional person looking at God saying, God, I, I, I'm trying real hard. Uh, God, tell me what I need to do. Tell me how to make, make you love me. God, uh, if I do this, will you love me? If I don't do that, will you love you? Will you love me? God, I'm trying to, to do real good so that you'll love me, and I'm trying to be pretty so that you'll love me. So God, please, 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 please love me. Well, if that's the way you look at your relationship with God, then you don't understand the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas is that he is the initiator of the love relationship, and all you have to do is sit there and look beautiful. He came from heaven for you. God stepped out of heaven and the environment of God, and he wrapped himself in human flesh in order to initiate a love relationship between you and him, he's the bridegroom and you're the bride. And he has, he has continually pursued you all of your life, even when you weren't interested. And he's been courting you and, and wooing you and flirting with you uh, all of your life. He's never given up on you. He's never quit loving you. He's never quit pursuing you. He's never quit wanting you, even though you had other lovers in life. God never gave up on you because look at this passage in 1 John 4. Let's read it out loud. We love him because he first loved us. So God pursues us in life, and Christmas says that the ultimate present from God is the presence of Jesus and that Jesus pursues us, we don't pursue him. And if we get that backwards, we're going to spend our life in a constant dysfunctional search for something that is not our responsibility. All right, contrast number four. Christmas presents are what we want, but God's presence is what we need. Every one of us in this building has an it in our life, right? Right? I mean, what I'm talking about is we, uh, we all want it. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Some, well, you know, for some people, and I'm, this is surface level and, and sad, but it'll uh, testify. Uh, so for some people, like this Christmas, it would be a, like a computer. I mean, if I could just get that computer, man, that would be it. I would be, whoo. Or maybe it's a, an iPhone 11 or some kind of a other uh, Android device or whatever it might be. I'm not advertising for anybody, but... But uh, that's it. I mean, if I could get, boy, if I could just get it, or maybe it's an automobile or, 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 or whatever it would be, if I could just get it, boy, that would be great. And I would never want anything else again. That would just be the awesome it of life. Can you remember the first it that you ever desired? Justin and I were talking the other day and uh, in kind of in this vein, and what we were talking about is we were talking about money that you get paid for, for the job that you do and salaries and so forth like that. Well, uh, I, I went to work, and I know many of you that are uh, a little even older than me, uh, you, went, you, you went to work and there was no such thing as minimum wage. Uh, I can remember easily working 12 hours a day for $12. You probably work, you know, all week for $12, but my, my, that's the first time I can remember working. The first minimum wage salary I ever made was $1.37 an hour. That was minimum wage, first time I ever made a minimum wage salary. Well, we were talking about this in connection with, man, you know, when we made $1.37 an hour, we were just thinking in life, boy, if we could ever make $2 an hour, whoo! Man, we made $2 an hour, we'd be set up. We could just get everything. We could get us a house. We could buy an automobile. We could, 
you know, and all through the years, you know, it's been like, it's been like, boy, if I could just get that job, if I could just, you know, live in that community, if I could buy that house, if I could live in that neighborhood, you know, if, if, if I could get in that position, boy, that would be, that would be it in life. So what was that it? What was it? A house? Was it a neighborhood? You know, if I could just live there, was it an automobile? Was it a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Man, if I could just get her, or just get him, whoo, that would be it. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> leave that alone. Uh, but I'm going to ever, I'm going to ask you, did you ever get it? That it you wanted, did you, did you ever get it? Well, if you did get it, you probably experienced a common experience for everybody who has gotten it in life. And the common experience is when you get it, then, <laughs> then shortly after, you're going to be saying, is, is this it? <laughs> because it loses its, it, it loses its shininess in, in, very quickly, right? It loses it, 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 its glow and, uh, and its pretty shine. Christmas presents are what we want. It is what we want in life. If we could just get it, we would be set up for life and it would be wonderful and it is the greatest and it is what I desire in life. And if I get it, I'll never ask for anything else in life because it is the greatest thing that we could ever ask in life. And the tradition of Christmas says that what we want in life is it. But God says the truth is it's not it that we need. It is God's presence that we need. That our family needs his presence because it's his presence that heals. It's his presence that forgives. It's his presence that drives bitterness and hostility and, 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 and hatred out of our life. And in the middle of all of our busyness, in order to get some of the it's of life in Christmas, I'm just encouraging and I believe God has encouraged us to realize that what we really need is the presence of God, Emmanuel, God with us, not based on our performance, not limited to one time a year. Uh, 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 that presence doesn't go away, but that it is God's presence that we need. And let me just give you this last one. This is the last uh, contrast. Christmas presents are under the tree, but God's presence was on the tree. Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death, help me quote it, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift that God gives is, G, is the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's got a gift for us. And the Bible says that you don't earn this gift, you don't deserve this gift. That what you earn and what you deserve is a life separated forever, but God has given you a gift. And, 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 and where did God give us this gift? How did, we, how did God purchase this gift for us so that he could give it to us? Our gift hung on the tree. Yeah, we got, we got all kinds of balls and bells and whistles and and shining things, and nice things, and, and sparkly things, and wonderful concepts, and great little uh, comforting things, and they hang on a tree, but God's Son hung on the tree so that God could give us the greatest gift of all. And he hung on that tree, he came, stepped out of heaven, stepped down on this earth, gave of himself every sacrifice, and he hung on that tree for us. His body was beaten beyond recognition. He was nailed to that tree. Blood flowed down that cross. Blood trickled onto the ground. Blood dripping out of all of the wounds in his body. But according to the scripture, that blood never lost its power. That that blood that was dripping out of his body and trickling down that cross and staining up the ground and, 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 and becoming a, 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 almost an unclean looking thing for us, that that blood had power in it and that that blood, even though it was shed like that, that it never lost its power. Meaning what? I mean, this might sound like a little, you know, a naive little statement, but that just means that the blood of Jesus can power wash our life. 
The blood of Jesus washes and cleanses us and power washes our life. It purges out of our soul uh, a, a guilty conscience. It, it, it purges the shame and the condemnation and it can, it, it, can, it, can, it can set us free because the blood of Jesus and the gift of God hung on the tree for us. And the shame of Christmas is that we focus on the presence and neglect the ultimate present, which is the presence of God in our life, Emmanuel, God with us. His name is Jesus. And how do you receive a gift from God? If I said to you this morning, if I said, you know, I have a gift for you, and I would like for you to have this gift, and I hold this gift out, what would you have to do in order to receive this gift? You just have to reach out and take it, right? Now, if I did this, if I said, I've got a gift for you here, and then you started to reach, and I said, whoa, wait a minute. You got any money? All right, give me $10, and I'll give you the gift. Well, is it a gift anymore? No, you've, you've bought it, right? All right, if I said, uh, you reach, I said, no, no, wait, 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 wait. You need to clean up, come clean up my house for me. Uh, now, is that a gift anymore? No, you, you've worked for it. You've earned it, right? The only way that it can be a gift is if I hand it to you and you reach out and freely take that gift and I give you that gift without any strings attached and without any payment or any schemes or anything. And that's what God says he has for us. He said, you know what? He said, you know what Christmas is? Christmas is God giving you a gift without any strings attached. It's not based on whether you've been naughty or nice. I'm going to find out, you know, uh, taking your name. I'm checking it twice. I'm going to find out if you're naughty or nice. And you go, you better be nice or you're not going to get. No, no, no. He knows you're not nice. He knows you're a long. I, I put it in some notes a few weeks ago. Uh, you're a long-term project. Listen, you, 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 didn't, you didn't surprise God when you gave your heart to him. If you've given your heart to Christ. He, you, God wasn't surprised that it took a long time and it's taken a long time to get you worked out in life. That doesn't surprise God. God knows everything about you. He knows everything that will happen, everything that did happen, everything that's going to happen. He knows how you're going to react, how you're going to respond. He knows everything about you and yet he still loves you in spite of all of that and he offers you the gift. So will you bow your head with me?